Hey guys, so we're going to go over the PDPM payment model. PDPM again stands for patient driven payment model. <clears throat> so the PDPM combined combined 25% limit of group and the concurrent therapy per discipline, at least 75% individually. So if you guys remember concurrent, concurrent means one therapist that can treat two people or two patients divided by half when billing. So if you're seeing two patients for 60 minutes, you can bill one patient for 30 and the other patient for 30. You cannot bill each patient for 60 minutes. This is used to track skilled treatment versus restorative intervention. And you still require at least 15 minutes on five separate days of the week to qualify as skilled intervention. Um, and it also still needs to be reasonable and appropriate for the intervention purposes. So definition, so a group is patients that are two, two to six patients. So, and remember concurrent is two treatments at one time, but doing different things. Then we have concurrent. So appropriateness is the patient must be medically stable. They must be alert and able to follow directions. They must be able to complete activities with supervision, have a higher level of function, whether that be orthopedic, arthritis, or a high level, high neurological level. They must be safely supervised without constant direct physical contact of another person. An inappropriate person would, or patient would be significant, significant cognitive impairment, lower functioning, especially low level neuro neurological damage, brain injury or spinal cord injury, unable to be safely supervised without the physical contact of another person or unsafe or who have safety concerns in general. So with PDPM, we're still focusing on primary diagnosis and not considering comorbidities as swallow and cognition. If we provide our value, then this may change. We use, we're using ICD codes to assist with classification and may incorporate surgical procedure codes. So this is a new thing. So surgical procedure codes will start being introduced in the PDPM model. We're looking at concern that clients will not be able to utilize OT services. So RUGS stands for resource utilization groups. So this is our, the old way of grouping in nursing homes where the residents were grouped according to their um, certain status or health status. This does not change that your experience as a student and field work though. <clears throat> so how do we get paid? So each place will be different. But for the most, for most places, your payments based on what OT gets paid, what PT gets paid, your NTA or your non-therapy ancillary pieces, which is your payment, your room and board and administrative staff, your non-case mix payment, which are the comorb comorbidities that you'll be diagnosed or have diagnosis of, your SLP, so your speech language pathologist payment, as well as your nursing payment. So that all gets totaled and dispersed depending on insurance providers. Then we have payment, which is the rate determined by the five-day assessment. So remember, as far as the five-day assessment, that will be completed by the OTR. Your five-day assessment will essentially be the evaluation process when you get into your clinic or whichever area you guys are in. Um, and this rate may change during the Medi Medicare Part A stay by completing the optional interim payment assessment or the IPA. So PT and OT, after day 20, the price drops 2% every seven days. So then we have MDS assessment schedule. So MDS stands for minimum data set. So you have your Medicare MDS assessment schedule type. So you have your five day scheduled PPS, which is prospective payment system um, assessment. Then you have your interim payment assessment and your PPS discharge assessment. So your five-day scheduled PPS assessment is between day one and eight, all covered Part A days until Part A is discharged unless the interim payment assessment is completed. Your interim payment assessment, if completed, must be done no later than 14 days after the change in the resident's first tier classification criteria is identified. Then you have your ARD, which is your assessment reference data of the assessment through Part A discharge unless another IPA is completed. Then your PPS discharge assessment, your PPS discharge is equal to the end date of the most recent Medicare stay or end date in general. 
and there's no application in the Medicare payment days. So then we have our interrupted stay policy, which readmission to the same SNF by the third midnight following discharge would be considered a continuation of the previous stay. So continuation of the previous day as a classification would be the same classification as, as, as it was prior to the discharge. Variable per diem, so per diem is each day. Adjustment clock continues and no new five days is completed. Then you have readmission of the same SNF more than three calendar days after discharge, which qualifies as a new stay. So there's a new five day assessment is required and this triggers a reset of the variable per diem adjustment clock. Then you're readmitted to a different SNF, which a new stay would begin within the new five day assessment time period. Then you have clinical categories. So you have major joint replacement or spinal surgery. So think of your total hip, hip arthroplasties, knee, knee replacements, all that stuff. You have your non-orthopedic, your acute neuro neurological conditions, other orthopedic, and you have your medical management. So this is infections, CA. Anyone remember what CA stands for? Cancer. Pulmonary, cardiovascular, and coagulation. So then we have section GG on the MDS for skilled nursing. So section GG is the functional ability and goals. So yay, another skill that we have to know. So a six on this scale is considered independent. So the patient completes the activity by himself or herself with no assistance. A score of five is set up or clean up assistant, assistance. So helper sets up or cleans up. Patient completes the activity. A four is supervision or touching assistance. Helper provides verbal cues or touching, steadying, and or contact guard assist as the patient completes the activity. Score of three is partial, moderate, partial or moderate assist. Helper does less than half of the effort. Two is substantial or maximal assist, which helper does more than half the effort. And number one is dependent. Helper does all the effort. So this is the payment component of, for PT and OT. So these are the emission performances. So you're modified independent all the way to not, not attempting. So your 06 to your 88s. And your functional scores on the side is how you how they decide how to pay or how insurance pays. So then we use these codes. So all these codes are different for the specific category. So you have certain categories for your self-care and eating, your oral hygiene, your toileting hygiene, your mobility. Um, so what it says on the side of the score, so it says average of two bed mobility items. Any ideas of what a bed mobility item could be utilized for? So think of like side rails, position pillows, stuff like that. So those would be bed mobility items. Then you have your transfer items. So a transfer item could be anything as simple as like a sliding board, a wheelchair, or like even a ho Hoyer lift. And then you have your two walking items. So those could be a walker, a cane, what have you. So then we have definitions of the terminology for billing. So eating is the ability to use suitable utensils to bring food to the mouth and swallow food once the meal is presented on a table tray includes modified food consistencies. So remember, those are like the nectar thick liquids, the honey thick liquids, et cetera. Oral hygiene, the ability to use suitable items to clean teeth. So if you have dentures, the ability to remove and replace dentures from and to the mouth, managing equipment for soaking and rinsing them. Then you have your toileting hygiene which is the ability to maintain per perennial hygiene, um, at adjust clothes before and after using the toilet, commode, bedpan, or urinal, and managing an ostomy, including wiping the opening, but not managing the actual opening. Then you have sit to supine, which is the ability to move from side, sitting on the side of the bed to laying flat on the bed, supine to sitting on the side of the bed, so the ability to safely move from lying on the back to sitting on the side of the bed with feet flat on the floor and with no back support. Then you have sit to stand, which is the ability to safely come to a standing position from sitting in a chair or on the side of the bed. Chair to bed to chair transfer, <clears throat> the ability to safely transfer to and from a bed to a chair or a wheelchair. Toilet transfer is the ability to safely get on and off the toilet or, toilet or commode. Walking 50 feet with two turns. So once standing, the ability to walk at least 50 feet and make two exact turns. 
walking 150 feet. So once standing, the ability to walk at least 150 feet in a corridor or similar place. Wheel 50 with two turns. So once seated in its wheelchair or scooter, manual or motorized, you can wheel at least 50 feet and make two turns with that. Then you have your wheel 150 feet. So once seated in a wheelchair or scooter, you're man either manual or motorized, you can wheel at least 150 feet in a corridor or similar space. Now the fun stuff with Dr. Fuchin. So need to emphasize the need for OT intervention. So this is the, the big important piece. And then we're using standardized assessments. We're using evidence-based interventions. And even though they do not cover cognition, you, we must document cognitive decline and behavioral changes. So how do we document cognition? We've kind of covered it a couple times in this class specifically. So think of your alert and oriented statuses. So that's kind of where we document cognition. And we're really looking at what does the patient need to go home? Do they need adaptive equipment, durable metal equipment? Like what do they need to set them up for success to be as independent as possible? How to make the transition to PDPM beneficial to the OT practitioners. So we're gonna focus on contributing to the section GG with the AMDS coordinator. We're gonna document the value of OT. So how OT intervention can prevent falls, how the OT intervention could maintain skin integrity, how grading and adapting will help the patient get home faster and how to minimize risk of poor outcomes and embrace the likelihood of achieving people successful, successfully get home. And then OT, we're valuing communication. So we're valuing the communication to clients so they understand the value of OT. We're important to the family and caregivers, the daily meetings. That's where we want to speak up and really advocate for our clients. The MDS coordinator, as well as faculty admission administration. And the value we really want to know and share the true value of occupational therapy and the maintenance of, is the maintenance or restorative is less valuable. And that is the end of our PDPM PowerPoint. Um, if you guys can review this before our next class on Monday, what I'll do is I'll have like a quick review um, and hopefully be able to clarify anything that you guys got confusing. Once again, this is just good stuff to know and to be cognizant of. Um, it's nothing that we're necessarily going to be using on a day-to-day -day or regular basis. Again, it depends on what clinic you're in. Um, but that's kind of why we need to know this for documentation in general.